My name is Mark Lester, and uh, I've uh, been in Nicaragua since 1985. Initially went with the uh, Marinol and did pastor work in the world for two, uh, two years, and then hooked up with the Center of Education and Experience at Oxford College, and, and have been working with them ever since. And so this presentation is, is uh, basically, uh, I'm going to go into a lot of detail. You don't need to write it down. Uh, the detail in, in itself is not that important. Uh, I'm going into the detail in order to make my case that after, after 30 years of, of doing this work and reflecting on it, using these circle praxis, uh, we've kind of come to the conclusion that we're at a stage where in order for us to implement the vision that Ignacio A. Correa had of the role of a university in the world today, uh, we need to have um, permanent infrastructure in the developing world that uh, who, whose specialization is bridging the global north and the global south. Okay. So I'm going to start by going a bit into the vision that they had at the university uh, and then how that was expanded on by the president of the Central American University in Managua in the 90s, Javier uh, Rostiaga. And uh, he did that by focusing on uh, what he said was a key issue in the world back then, global inequality. We've heard a lot in this conference already about that as a key, continues to be a key issue. And then go into and give a, share the example of an institutional infrastructure that has developed between the interaction and constantly building upon uh, the work of three organizations, the Center for Global Education and Experience at Augsburg College, uh, the Wings of Peace Foundation, and uh, the Research and Development Institute of the Central American University known as NEMA. Okay? Uh, now, this is a picture that you put again. And basically he said that uh, the UCA would only truly be the UCA if it put itself at the service of the people in such a way, and I think this is a radical statement, that allowed itself to be guided by the oppressed peoples themselves. Okay, that's, that's a whole nother dimension. Um, and uh, to do that, he said, it, it needs to be, Luca needs to be in dialogue with a range of non-elite groups. So I'm gonna break down a little bit about what we mean by non-elite groups. Uh, now, uh, how? He talked about three big moments. In, in this. The first moment, and you can see this with the Ignatian pedagogy, it dovetails nicely with the Ignatian pedagogy. He said, we need to make a great effort as a university to become aware of the reality. In another word, another word he said, it, we have to be able to grasp what is at stake. Okay? And then we have to assume responsibility for that reality. So that's the way the world is, that's the way the situation is, and I'm responsible for that situation. And then thirdly, bring about real changes and the way he put it, in order to take the crucified people down from the cross. In other, way, in other words, the oppressed people are the crucified people. And that's how he, he approached it. Uh, and uh, the only Jesuit in that community that survived was John Sobrino, because he wasn't there at the time of the massacre. And uh, what he said about his fellow Jesuits, he said, what kind of university did, did they leave us? In a word, the belief that academic and Christian knowledge must be and can be at the service of the poor. Okay? And then you're saying, not only has it to be at their service, but that has to guide our educational mission. Okay? Now, Ayyakuriya did that within the context of the reality in El Salvador back then. Okay? Now, the president of the Central American University took that concept and globalized it. Okay? So I'm going to go a little bit into what uh, Ignace, uh, uh, Javier Gorostiaga, the president of the UCA in the early 90s, how he globalized. So what he did is he used the United Nations Development Report of 1992, whose purpose was to address why is the world unstable, 1992, okay? And he said the world's unstable, and in fact the report said it's unstable, because income distribution takes the form of a champagne glass. And just as a champagne glass gets very unstable when the top is heavy in relationship to the base, that's a good paradigm for world instability. And as the graph shows, the, the wealthiest 20% at that time got 82.7% of world income. And so Javier asked the question, 
our Jesuit universities, we're training people to support this system. And we really need to be training people to overturn the champagne glass, is how he put it. Now, 15 years later, and this is the most recent, recent version of the champagne glass I've found in 2007. Um, now, if you read the 92 report, went into a time capsule, popped out in 2007, and were shown this picture, without knowing any of the events that had transpired since 92, your logical conclusion would be the world's in a much more unstable place today than it was then. You know? uh, and, and, and I think this is really the backdrop for terrorism in, in the world. Also for the gang activity. If people feel the system has a place for them, they're not going to actively want it. <coughs> they're going to want if people feel that the world has a place for them, they're not going to actively work to blow up the system. Um, and so the question arises, can you effectively fight terrorism without changing this picture? Or to put it another way, if you do not work to change this picture, are you in essence planting the seeds for future terrorism? Because if you're not act actively working to change this gross inequality, then the violence used against, quote, the terrorists will be interpreted by many around the world as violence used to support this picture. Okay. <clears throat> now, uh, happily, there's a growing consensus about the centrality of this issue. Thomas Piketty, a French uh, economist, um, uh, last year published this book that was on the uh, bestseller list. And basically, uh, through hard data, going back to the 18th century, showed that Never in world history has income been more unfairly distributed than it is today. <clears throat> now, uh, last month, the United Nations came out with their new 15-year goals called the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, they are going to be in effect from 2015 to 2013 is the goal to achieve them. And if you look at the 17 goals, eight of them really deal with this issue of income inequality. Uh, three of them expressly mention it in their, in their title. So, what does this mean for us in terms of uh, our educational mission? This task of preparing people to change this reality is more pressing than ever. The situation has gotten worse, and there's more universal acknowledgement of the problem. Now, the topic of the, of the day on every college campus is internationalizing the campus. There's a wide recognition that uh, students need to have experience of the broader world to really be an educated person today. And under Ayacuria and Gorostiaga's approach, yes, but that contact needs to be with the bottom 90%, okay? That's the broad contact with the non-elite groups that Ayacuria talked about. And most of our contact in our educational uh, experiences is not with that group, okay? So that requires a conscious effort. Now, this reflection that Ayukuria and, and Gorostiaga came to was the result of the circle of praxis. You look at what's happening, you ask why is it happening, so grasp uh, the, uh, the reality, you know, grasp what's at stake, and then uh, what does it mean for me, assume responsibility for it, and then take the crucified uh, Christ off the cross, okay, so respond to that reality. And this is another version of the same uh, circle of praxis. I just like it better because it has this spiral nature to it. So as you, as you complete it, you progress along. You know? And that's what propels your deeper analysis. So what I'm going to do now is share with you uh, the, this process that these three institutions have gone through that has led them to provide a <coughs> basic structure to allow this to happen. So uh, the Center for Global Education Experience, which is a project of Augsburg College, the Winds of Peace Foundation, a private found, uh, founder based, a funder based out of Minnesota, and the Central American University's Research and Development Institute, known as NEPA Um So building each one, building on what the other has done. So to start with Augsburg College, it's a small Lutheran college in downtown uh, Minneapolis. And in 1979, they opened up a campus in Cuernavaca, Mexico. And then in 84, in Nicaragua. In 87, El Salvador. In 88, Guatemala. 
and in 94, Namibia and Southern Africa. So it's a small Lutheran college, and its only uh, off-campus sites are only in the developing world. Uh, now, implementing this vision, uh, even though the center in Mexico started with semester programs, in its Central America programs, it started with immersions. Why? Because basically parents would not send their sons and daughters to countries at war. You know? And the, the, the purpose of the immersion was to raise people's awareness so that they would go back and work against U.S. support to the wars in El, Sa in El Salvador, Nicaragua, Guatemala, etc. cetera. Um, and we worked in close relationship with the president of the Central American University in Managua, Cesar Jerez. He met with all our groups in the 80s. And then he was succeeded by Javier Gorostiaga, who was also a key uh, ally of ours. Uh, then, in the 90s, we uh, formed an alliance with a lot of different Jesuit universities to do the student immersions. So since 98, we've done 62 student immersion groups. Okay? And there's a, a partial list of some of them where they've come from. Uh, just student groups, 62 in total. And then we moved into immersions with faculty. Now, obviously, having the poor direct our educational effort, students is good, faculty is even better. You know? And so we've done, since 99, 29 pure faculty uh, delegations. Um, and there's a, a partial list of them as well. As well. Also, the presidents and cabinets from the Uni University of San Francisco and Seattle University. Uh, <clears throat> now, in 2007, the current Vice President for Mission and Ministry at Seattle University, Joe Orlando, did his doctoral thesis on the impact these faculty immersions had on faculty's awareness of the Jesuit mission and found that it had a tremendous impact. And a secondary uh, benefit was it built community across different disciplines on campus. <clears throat> now, then, in, a, in an even closer alliance with Jesuit universities, uh, we started doing their immer international immersion experience of what's known as the Ignatian Colleagues Program. Now that's an orientation program for the top administrators in Jesuit uh, colleges and universities. So since uh, 2008, when the program began, we've done 16 of those immersions, most of them in El Salvador, where those administrators got to see the context out of which Aya Correa's vision of a, a, a university should be. Um, now, this is a list of the numbers of those top administrators and the schools that they come from. So we work very closely with the Jesuit universities in that. Uh, we've also done some alumni groups for some of the Jesuit universities and we're now beginning to do Jesuit high school immersions as well. So all of this work done in a close alliance with Jesuit uh, universities. Then we moved into semester programs in the 90s, uh, where the programs are designed so that the movement for social change in these countries, in the developing world, provide the, most of the content for the course. Okay? So you go out and meet with the movements. You know? That's the way they're designed. So it's, it, it's an even, a further step in having the oppressed direct uh, our education. Um, so we meet with uh, the women's movement. We meet with the indigenous movement. We meet with uh, peasants. We meet with uh, educators and we meet with urban and rural communities. So it's closer to having the agenda set by the oppressed peoples themselves. And now, um, we're, all of those examples require students, professors, to go from the first the, the developed world into the developing world. Now we're trying to get the developed world into the classroom so that it impacts stu uh, students who, for whatever reason, either don't want to or or will not come to a developing country. And so uh, in alliance with a Boston College uh, Master of Social Work professor, Tomeo, who came on a Boston College professor immersion, he went back and because of our institutional infrastructure, I'm talking about contacts, presence, knowledge of local reality, uh, we were able to help him uh, facilitate the participation of these three individuals in three separate classes of the social work. Um, uh, thereby having students be in touch with that reality. And then this is a uh, picture of a physics professor at Augsburg College, Ben Stotra, 
And in a freshman physics class, they're working on a device that would measure humidity in a beehive. And uh, they work with the Minneapolis uh, beekeepers. And because of our institutional infrastructure and contacts, we were able to hook him up with a uh, young, innovative beekeeper in San Juan de Rio Coco, a kind of remote area of Nicaragua. And they called him up on his cell phone and were able to get his take on what it's like to be a beekeeper in that kind of a context. Um, and now, most recently, this is a math professor at John Sovich at Augsburg College. Um, and uh, because of our institution connections, he wanted his class to work on something that had a real impact. Uh, and so we hooked him up with this Forest Strangers Cooperative in an area called Peña Blancas, Nicaragua, a remote area, where they're in a buffer zone for a reserve area. Uh, and they're in a struggle with a local large landowner that is buying up land, uh, claiming that the peasants are destroying the forest. The peasants on their own have an ecotourism cooperative. They're reforesting, claiming that actually they're having a much better beneficial effect on the environment. So what's his class doing? He's using uh, NASA remote sensory data to be able to calculate uh, changes in nighttime temperature and leaf area index that then would be able to, uh, that the students would then use and calculate the amount of oxygen that they, their reforestation effort is doing, thereby helping them in their local uh, dispute. So this is something, a service project, a lot of service projects in the developing world, people come down and do stuff that local people could actually do better, especially if it's like building. In this case, they set the agenda, this is what we need, and it's something they could not do, but it is something the math class can do. And because of our institutional presence there, we were able to match those two up. Uh, so that's even further, having our agenda set by the oppressed people. So uh, to kind of summarize, uh, the Center for Global Education Experience at Oxford College, in its use of the uh, circle of praxis, and in trying to look at this uh, challenge of Ayakuria, uh, started first with uh, students and with immersions, uh, again, becoming aware of the reality. That, that's the first step. Then working with faculty a step further and having an impact on the institution. And then administrators of uh, top, uh, top administrators at Jesuit universities. So after 30 years of doing these kind of emergence and, and semester programs, um, that work has given us a wide variety of contexts and knowledge of local realities. And this is what I mean when I say institutional infrastructure, okay? Those kind of contacts and networks. Uh, and now with the new technologies, we can make this wealth available in the classroom in the global world, and thereby expand the impact of the social movements in the developing world. Okay? Uh, so now I'm gonna talk about uh, the, the Central American University's Research and Development Institute, uh, UCA, their uh, reflection process. So this, uh, this institute was started in 1989. And the founder, one of the founders, Peter Marchetti, said that the purpose of the institute was to sim the simultaneous formation of the peasants, ourselves, the researchers, and university youth. So the interaction between the peasants, the researchers, and, and the youth would result in the formation of all three parties. Okay. And so what they've done is they've tried to do research on what's blocking the development of the peasants with them. You know, and then initiate actions to remove those bottlenecks. Uh, again, that's putting the research now uh, power of the university at the service of the poor. Uh, so one of the most uh, well-known uh, works uh, of this results of this process was Nikhil Khan and their initial research with the peasants saw that one of the big obstacles to development was the lack of credit to the small farmer sector. Why? Uh, after the Santa Anisas election in 1990, basically they reprivatized the banks and the private banks would not lend to what was known as the agrarian reform sector, those that benefited from the agrarian reform. So without access to credit, small farmers were selling off their land and their analysis was, jointly, that that was going to lead to a rollback of the agrarian reform. Farmers would sell off their land, become farm workers, and move into a much more impoverished state. 
And so in response to that, they put together the largest rural, what is today the largest rural lending institution in the country, called the Local Development Fund. And here's a map of the offices throughout the country. Um, now, the total portfolio today, $86 million. Okay? That's the largest rural lender in the country. Uh, this is very significant in the microcredit movement. Most microcredit is directed to the urban sector. And if you have credit available for the urban sector and no credit available to the rural sector, it results in rural to urban migration. And they're already overcrowded cities get even more overcrowded. This was the result of the reflection they did. And that's why they put together this, uh, this large lending institution. So this is an example of how they did the research with the oppressed, with the poor, um, and then uh, solve the problem. Uh, now, here's the third element of the infrastructure, the Winds of Peace Foundation. Uh, this was started through Louise and Harold Nielsen's reflection on an experience they had. So their uh, circle of practice. So what happened? They had started their own furniture making company. It started in the basement of Harold's mom's home. But by the mid 80s, that was the factory down below. They, they make all the furniture for uh, subways around the world. Uh, a lot of Dairy Queen's other type of fast food uh, furniture. So in 83, they took a Center for Global Education and Experience trip to Mexico in Nicaragua. Uh, it had a huge impact on their lives. Uh, completely transformed their perspective and led them to do two things. On the one hand, increase support to the Center for Global Education Experience so other people would have a similar type of eye-opening experience. And secondly, began to finance projects in the developing world. Uh, and then in 1985, they, in this continuing reflection process, they decided we're gonna sell the entire business to the workers, this is in a small rural town uh, called Kenyon, Minnesota, and then use the funds to directly fund Nicaraguan organizations. And then they contracted with the Center for Global Education Experience to basically do that work in Nicaragua. So you can see an organic relationship developed between the Winds of Peace Foundation formed out of reflection on an experience that a couple had here. You know? And that's what led them to do that. And then they contracted with uh, the center to do their work. So building on the experience and knowledge the center already had from the immersion and, uh, uh, and semester program work. So, how does this connect with uh, Neat Lapan? Wins a piece with Neat Lapan. Well, a part of Neat Lapan's research, what they found was this is their uh, seminal work. It's called the Peasant Farm. It's an analysis of the development of Nicaragua, saying, proposing the development of the whole country could be based on strengthening the peasant farmer sector because it's a highly agrarian country. You know? And so uh, they. And, and that's why they put together this loan fund, being the first obstacle. So Winds of Peace decides to start working in Nicaragua. They build on this research that, uh, and decide to target the rural sector as well. And then they do two things. They lend, they provide credit to this peasant farmer sector through the large national infrastructure that Meet Lapan had put together called the Local Development Fund. And since 97 has invested more than $7 million in that fund. Then they also lent nearly $2 million directly to farming cooperatives, many of them involved in the fair trade movement. <clears throat> so what we've learned, this bridge is essential. Um, there, there's, there's a need for an institutional infrastructure to facilitate institutional structure, structural contact for effective impact. Um, it's not effective for everyone to start from scratch or uh, start based on our own limited knowledge and, and context. But to effectively have the poor set our agenda, we need to build on a continually growing body of knowledge and context. Now, this is a big change because the, the normal thing is every project sets up its own actual infrastructure. So. Uh, Let's take an example of immersions. How many of you have participated in immersions? In international immersions? Where, where, where did you go? Let's have a question there. Haiti? Haiti? Mm -hmm. Nicaragua. 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 
So these are these are very important experiences, right? um, and without an in-depth presence, just looking at the versions, for example, um, speakers tend to be selected by the personal contacts the professor has, uh, whether they're national or foreign. If it's a foreign professor, it tends to be contacts they've met either from infrequent travel or uh, from people they've met at conferences, that kind of thing. If it's a national professor and who doesn't do this, doesn't make this the focus of their work, then it tends to be the contacts they have because they have another job. Being a professor, they have to teach. And so they don't have the time to dedicate to, to selecting it. So let's see how this, how this uh, works out. Let's take an example of women's organizations. These are four examples of uh, women's organizations in Nicaragua that have a national impact, just four. Um, so you, you want the group to meet with women, okay? So which group do you choose? Do you choose online, which is the official Southeast the Party's women's organization, whose uh, director in the, uh, from the year 2000 quit in 2007 after Danielle Ortega got elected because she said uh, they have no autonomy. And this is a picture of one of the government agencies celebrating their 30th anniversary. Or do you go with the Maria Mena Quadra uh, movement of working and unemployed women? started by a woman who headed the Women's Secretariat of the Sandinista Union, but when she went out to support women striking in a free trade zone and was severely beaten up, and her union did not support her, decided she needed to leave and start her own NGO whose focus would be on free trade zone women and unemployed women. Or do you go with the Nicaraguan uh, Autonomous Women's Movement? It's made up of women who uh, originally were part of the Sandinista movement in the 80s, but have since left the Sandinista party, claiming their, uh, the, claiming all the time that Don Yorantega is turning uh, his rule into a dictatorship, a family dictatorship. Or do you go with the Network of Women Against Violence, which is a nation, national network of local women's groups, uh, primarily focused on ending domestic violence. Um, now, you need to know the diversity that exists to make an informed decision about what's the best group to choose or how you can reflect that diversity in the women's movement. And uh, that's what we do. We're constantly following what's happening, uh, and we, uh, we have our groups constantly evaluating the speakers. Uh, take an example of a service learning project or just a development project. How many of you have participated in the service learning project? An international one? Yeah. Where? Peru. Peru, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Guatemala. Guatemala, yeah. <laughs> okay. um, We found, from our experience, that there's people in every community that are very good at relating to the outside world. And if you trace the, the flow of resources that come in from development pro projects, they tend to flow within that group's circle of friends and acquaintances. And so, even in poor communities, there's a local elite. They don't look like they're elite, they look like they're poor, but there's actually a local elite that's controlling resources. Uh, and so, if this is true, then it becomes doubly important to know the context of where you are working uh, in relation uh, to a counterpart or service or project. That's also why it's important that every project not start from scratch, but project sponsors are notorious for starting from scratch, even setting up their own, uh, their own local organization. So let's take a look at uh, an example. In Yasika Sur, is a remote part of Nicaragua. Actually, the term Yasika Sur only refers to a geographical area of many small villages. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna look at an example in that area. So there's a US organization that works in four areas, health, education, housing, and loans, okay? Um, and they worked in other areas, and they decided they're going to work in Madagascar now, and chose Yasika Sur as their uh, area of influence. And then they hired a doctor to supplement their uh, medical services, medical attention, uh, bought land to build houses, uh, chose families, and began the building process. But they started from scratch, not knowing that there already existed a highly organized women's group in the area known as the, the Union of Organized Women of Yasika Sur, who moistens their acronym in Spanish. 
that had already gone through a process, and that's a picture of them meeting. They'd already gone through a process where they reached a consensus about what their priorities were. The number one priority being medical attention. And so what they've done is they've gone to the Ministry of Health and lobbied the Ministry of Health to give them a doctor for the first time in their history. Okay? This is a picture of them meeting with the Ministry of Health in the, in the local area. Uh, now, the U.S. organization, not knowing this, actually defined as their area of influence an area that was incomplete in the people's view. So the women went to the U.S. organization and said, hey, you can't cut out a bunch of people. You have to include these people. Okay? Then the U.S. organization, in order to hire their doctor that would make the rounds, hired the doctor in their health post, the one they lobbied the Ministry of Health to get. So they had to go back to the Ministry of Health and lobby to get a permanent doctor in their health post. Then when they expanded their program, they hired that doctor. Okay? Uh, when they decided to build houses, the women had already selected who were the most in need of housing. The U.S. organization had no knowledge of that, selected their own beneficiaries on their own criteria. So now we have a group from the U.S., nurses that want to do service learning in a community. Obviously, it's much easier to hook them up with the U.S. organization because they speak English. You know? But if we do that, we're, we're, we're taking legitimacy away from the local organization that is always going to be there. It's not depending on the $125,000 a year the U.S. organization was investing in. Which experience has the oppressed people guide the work? Um, what we've also learned, now with globalization, everything is both global and local. Um, there are positive and negative influences that are impacting the population we're working with. And so understanding the starting point for any group implies understanding of the global and local context. Now, the, the chief collaborator for Winds of Peace Foundation is one of the founders of Nibapan, Rene Mendoza. And he's actually coined this term called global to designate that reality. Um, and so let's take a, a, a globalization example, fair trade. Okay, so you all know fair trade was started precisely in the face of globalization to try to ensure that the producer gets a larger percentage of the final price of the product. In this case, we're talking about coffee. So the whole fair trade infrastructure is set up to ensure this. You have fair trade certifiers that certify that the coffee is grown under those conditions. You have fair trade vendors that will provide special lent money to the fair trade producers so they can produce. And you have fair trade buyers that will pay the extra price. So what happened? Uh, this uh, case of fraud is a good example uh, that good intentions are not enough. That uh, uh, if, if we're going to have oppressed people set the agenda, we have to know this local context. Uh, so just to explain it, these are the players. You've got grassroots producers and producer co-ops that plant and harvest the coffee. Then they send it to a second tier cooperative that processes the coffee and relates to the buyers and sells it. Now, basically, legally, these grassroots producers are the owners of the second tier cooperative. Okay? And then the other players are the fair trade lender that will lend this cooperative uh, money so they can produce without any collateral. The only collateral is already signed agreement with the buyer. And so what that agreement says is when the buyer pays for the coffee, he pays in this direction. Okay? So the lender makes sure they get their money. So that's the setup. So what happens? We have some grassroots producers in, in that fair trade uh, cooperative that come to us and say, look, the fair trade lender is impounding our property, claiming we owe $4 million. Now, because we have an institutional presence there, and they don't know how to figure this out, they came to us to ask, ask our help. So our researchers went in and, and looked at the legal documents, looked at the minutes of the, uh, of the meetings where all this stuff was supposedly approved, and what we found out was that uh, a local elite family whose son was the manager of the second care cooperative in the 2011-2012 in the harvest when the price of coffee shot up enormously, they started their own family coffee business. And what he did is he took money from the fair trade lender, wearing his hat as the second care cooperative manager, but did not use it to buy coffee for his cooperative. He bought coffee for the family business. And he bought so much coffee that they couldn't store it properly. It went bad, 
and he defaulted on the loan. But because he was wearing his second year cooperative hat when he took out the loan, legally, the loan uh, was held by the second year cooperative. Uh, and it's because of our infrastructure and presence, we we're able to do the research on that, provide the, the producers and the producer cooperatives with the information and help them negotiate with the fair trade lender so that uh, eventually the, the, the loan got written off. You know? uh, so to end on a more positive example, uh, to give you an example of the type of positive impact this type of infrastructure, local context and knowledge can provide. Uh, look at this thing. After lending nearly $10 million in Nicaragua, since 1998, the Winds of Peace Foundation. In spite of the fact that Nicaragua is con considered by lenders a high-risk country, okay? In spite of the fact that there was a no-payers movement started at the grassroots level where people said, we're not gonna pay our loans uh, in the year 2007. In spite of the fact that San Juan de Miracoco, where we're doing a lot of our lending for coffee, has been redlined. In other words, other microfinance people will not lend money in that area because they're famous for not paying it back. In spite of the fact that coffee rust and anthracnose uh, destroyed up to 80% of the coffee harvest in these areas uh, in 2012. And in spite of the fact that Winds of Peace does not require any collateral, okay, um, we have a loan loss rate of less than 2%. Okay? So that type of, and that's only possible by having a deep knowledge of what's going on at the local level and what the dynamics are. Um, so, our reflection is, after 30 years of doing immersions in alliance with Jesuit universities at all levels, students, faculty, administrators, after 20 years of semester programs, 30 years of financing projects in a globalized world where everything is both local and global, uh, if we're going to be effective in our educational mission, allowing ourselves to be guided by the poor, then we need to have enough depth in the local reality, to know the local context for any intervention, so that we are in dialogue with a broad range of non-elite sectors, okay? To put it in Boros Diaga's terms, that was in Korea's terms. If we're going to effectively understand the system that is reproducing poverty in this world and fight it, if we're gonna train future leaders to fight it, we need depth. We need enough depth to understand the global local dynamics. That requires an institutional presence permanent infrastructure, people on the ground, so that every experience builds on the next. And it's not just a, lot, a series of isolated good experiences. The difference with A.E. Korea's vision is that we're called not only to transform our students, but to transform the reality. <clears throat> um, and that's why the span is important. Uh, uh, actively, an element that's actively working to link the two realities. Because what good is it to have all this depth of local knowledge, uh, local analysis, uh, if it's not made available to other educational institutions, institutional funders? Um, so this is where we are now. We're talking about the need for what we call a synergy center. Uh, instead of a series of isolated experiences, a place to build on one another's experience, to build on one another's research based on studying the local reality, the local dynamics, how the global impacts the local, and vice versa. And then making that available to a wider public, development organizations, uh, financial institutions, educational institutions, buyers, businesses, uh, NGOs. This is the infrastructure needed if we're going to really implement Aya Korea's vision of having the poor guide, uh, guide us as educational institutions. And uh, given the gravity of the situation depicted in this picture, we can't afford to have everyone starting from scratch on the task of overturning the champagne glass. So that's basically the argument I wanted to make. Again, the detail is not so much important as the case for the need for that kind of infrastructure. If we're really going to implement the vision, they may be going to talk about it. So leave it up to questions or comments. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. um, so, sorry, you said about this, uh, create a synergy of the college with other maybe educational institutions or NGOs to share that information and research and groundedness and those pillars in the local community. Um, is there anyone else that, in addition to the Peace Wings or, or the UCA, that uh, Alex Brooks College is working with currently, like other educational institutions? Um, in the United States or elsewhere? Well, uh, I mean, the, the earlier slides I showed you, the amount of Jesuit colleges and universities were working on. And we've been working on the immersion part. With BC, we had that one example of a social work class where we helped them get uh, speakers in our reality into their classroom. You know? And that's what, we're, that's what the idea of Synergy Center would do. It would do that for any institution that was interested in building. And we're interested in the experiences that other institutions have as well. You know? so it's not like we have all the experience. But we want, uh, when groups come down, and I agree, we have this in Nicaragua, we should have a similar thing in, in the South of like, well, all the places so that our institutions, if we bring people down, it's not an isolated experience. We, we leave what we've discovered behind, and we're building on what other people have discovered. You know, that's the argument I'm making. And so in Nicaragua, we're open to anything. Actually, right now, Rene Mendoza is, uh, tomorrow, is going to be meeting with Equal Exchange. Uh, because Equal Exchange buys a lot of coffee from a lot of the coffee farmers that we're working with to share this knowledge we have of the local reality so that Equal Exchange can make use of it as well. And that's the idea. Because uh, so that their reality is what impacts us, whether an educational institution, a business, a lender, etc. Otherwise, our, without that kind of knowledge, our experiences, we can be working at cross purposes to what we really want to do. Does that answer your question? I just wanted to make a comment. I work on addressing health disparities in the Bronx, um, and I want to say that what your experiences You know, it's really like they're not necessarily getting to the local people on the ground. So I just want to say, like, I really appreciate your thank you. Thanks. I think that's a very important point. It's just not, it's not just an international issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that would transform our universities. If we have that vision, that we have to have a lot of local knowledge. So we're interested in, in you know, researchers are coming to Nicaragua. Build on what is already known. And, and, and you know, we would offer to be a clearinghouse for that kind of knowledge. So that then you're taking a step further instead of maybe doing research on something that's already been done but you just don't know. You know? Uh, we're also trying to translate all of this research. So on the Winds of Peace website, peacewinds.org, you'll find all of Renee's writings. You'll find the study we did on the cooperatives to identify what the problems were. We've got to try and make this available to a public that maybe doesn't even speak Spanish, but is interested in somehow interacting. You know. But right, it's true for all of our if we that requires a lot more effort on our part to know that book we want, be it outside the country, be it in the as well. Um so you work a lot with local infrastructure in Central America. What are the um, what are some effects of either policies of the US or other international players on your work and what you're trying to do and just general life in Central America right now? Uh, well, uh, we, we don't officially work with the U.S. government as yes. such. What, what are the, some consequences of maybe U.S. policies or other international players, other players in the system? Um, well, I would say the U.S. and a lot of international governments have their own particular agenda that they're working on. Now, and so their development policies are kind of tied into that agenda. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say if that's your agenda, it's not really developing. Okay. And I would say even uh, those of us who don't have a quote political agenda, but don't have the poorest agenda, it doesn't have development results either. Yeah. That's why we're arguing. You really need to do the research to find out. And it, I'm not talking about, I mean, part of it is you know formal research, but part of it is finding out who the players are, what the dynamics are, what the relationships are. When I talk about infrastructure, that's what I'm talking about. The, the knowledge of the local realities, the relationships people have, the power dynamics, 
That's a very important element. If we don't know those, and we come in as an outside player, we can actually be empowering the wrong people in the sense that they're the people that are already empowered and already preventing real progress from happening. Absolutely. Like, so do you see examples of, again, like other, like you mentioned the NGO, but maybe like other policies, like US policy or so-and-so, um, on your work, again, or just in general on those local um, power structures, et cetera? Uh, well, I don't know what kind of specific policies uh, you're Well, I'm, I'm just, I'm just curious. I'm, I know, like, historically, like, through the 80s, et cetera, um, there was obviously a lot of international policy had a very strong influence on Central America, uh, and I've kind of fallen out of the picture uh, in, as far as Central, Central America goes. I'm just curious how involved the international system is currently in Central America. Well, I'm you know, just give you one example. Um, before the 2006 elections, when Ortega was leading the polls, um, there was a full page, uh, the front page of the uh, La Prensa newspaper, five days before the election was, Ortega will put at risk family remittances. Now, family remittances refers to money Nicaraguans living outside the country send back home. To give you the, uh, an idea of the impact, it's over a billion dollars a year. Total exports, last year for Nicaragua, 3.5 billion, okay? So a billion dollars is a lot of money. Actually, if you look at all the individual export products, none of them comes close to the billion dollars that Nicaraguans have migrated or sent home, which means, in essence, Nicaragua's principal export for its people, you know? That's not just Nicaragua. El Salvador is almost five, Guatemala is almost six, uh, Mexico is over 20. I mean, basically what this says is the economies are not meeting the needs of the people. You know? And so they reproduced a, uh, a letter that the Republican congressman had written to Congress Rice and Secretary of State. It basically said, should or technically, we agree with U.S. Ambassador in Nicaragua, Paul Trevelyan, uh, that that should uh, result in a complete reevaluation of U.S. Nicaragua relations including all, f all forms of assistance, and this was the trump card, the movement of remittances across borders. So that's a way of reaching in and trying to affect the vote near your home. You vote for a tag, we're gonna cut off your access to remittances. What made that credible? George Bush had done that in the case of Cuba. Okay, so that was, that's the kind of intervention. And in fact, the WikiLeaks, you know those documents, yes. the internal US government documents shows that the US ambassador was negotiating with two people on the right and the elections in November. In October, he said, who's ever behind has to cede to the other one. Because if not, or the, the anti sandinista vote will be split and Ortega will win. And, and, and they did not unite in spite of the ambassador's work because they both were convinced only they could win. And Ortega won with 38% 30, 30, of uh, it. I mean, that's an example of the past. Now, what's happened recently, U.S. ambassador is completely quiet. Uh, the, another one of the WikiLeaks documents uh, said shortly after that that uh, the ambassador reported to Washington that Ortega denounces the U.S. all the time in international forums, but he does everything he wants. What are those two major issues? Stopping drug trafficking, and no country comes close to Nicaragua's uh, in, uh, interception of drugs flowing north, and uh, the flow of terrorists somewhere. And apparently Ortega has made the migration information completely available to the U.S. Uh, and so those are the two things the U.S. is most concerned about, so the U.S. ambassador has said that. That's what it seems like. I know like that's, uh, that's Yeah, that, that, that was kind of my question. It's just, it seemed quiet in yeah, a way, but is. you're closer to it than I am, so yeah. that's your security sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, you talked a lot about how you want students Well, I wasn't talking about having them travel, although I think that's a good thing, but the, the expense. What I was trying to do was get them down into our classrooms, because I think we're the ones that need to be educated. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, that's, that's what I was talking about. U.S. students on the version or post-grad 
service experiences. But recognizing that the opportunity to do that is such a privilege mm -hmm. that so many of us in this room have had or will have. And I love just some of the ideas you shared about how to help students from Nicaragua's voices be heard in U.S. classrooms. Mm -hmm. Because we do need that, I believe. And thank you for just being a leader in that new job. Okay, I think it's time, but I'm willing to stay and answer, and answer questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.